Welcome to the Nevcast, where three bros talk business, art, justice, and the pursuit of Jesus. Any day above ground is a good day. Get ready to laugh, cry, and kiss 30 minutes goodbye with Peter Nevland, Dave Nevland, and Rashi. Colin Roy. Hello, Peter. Roy. Hello, Roy. How's it going? There's another Nevland here, too. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. There you are. There we all are. We're all connected. We're we got merged. Rashid, too. Oh, hi, Rashid. Hey, hey, Mr. Williams. How you doing? I'm doing extremely very good. I hope you're doing as well. Oh, yeah, man. Moving forward, man. That's all you can do in life. Move forward. Trust God and move forward. <laughs> Learn from the I'm past and move fine. forward. Yeah. So, that's absolutely right. That you know, Roy, he sounds like a wiener dog. Yeah. Well, you know, you don't want to call somebody a wiener dog until they understand the context. Of the <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're doing a I show see. and you can shock people and then bring it back around. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to go full circle. I get it. It's all about. Uh, it's all about. First, you have to get people's attention, and then you have to hold their attention. Absolutely, yeah. Then of you... course, holding holding their attention is, is is listener engagement, which is much harder to do than just getting their attention. That is absolutely true. true. That is very, very true. True. So, uh, you know, we what we need to do, actually, is we need to give a gold star right now to Dave. A gold star? I get a gold star. He gets a gold star. He read the whole book oh, yeah. last night and this morning, and you started last night, what, about 9 o'clock? yeah. How long, right. how long did it take you to read this book, Wiener Dog Marketing, that we wrote? Well, a couple hours, maybe? Maybe a couple hours? A couple two, hours. Two and a half hours? Yeah, so, it's, so I, it's thought it, I, I thought it was interesting, but I started too late, and I, I, I kept finding myself, like, you know, nodding off. But not because of the content, because, just because I started too late. Yeah, Dave, you, you fall asleep very easily. But I wake up early. It's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. So, um... So, you know, we thought it would be great, uh, you know, the book just came out and uh, we thought it would be great to talk about it and obviously to have you on, Roy, because uh, in order to write the book, I interviewed you Yes. And, uh, and then what I wanted to do was, you know, sort of break it down for people and allow people to kind of go on a journey of, uh, of understanding what it is that allows you to be able to predict success in either a business or, or in anything else that you're doing before it actually happens. Yeah, because Roy brings out in the book, that's C-H-E-A-T-I-N-G. Yes, that's right. That spells, uh, that spells a, I think that spells something. Heating with a C on the front. Heating with a C. <laughs> this is a cheating. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. So, uh, so Dave, what, what uh, uh, questions then stirred up in your mind? <laughs> Well, okay, right. I mean, at first, I, before I was at, before I read the book, I was going to ask you what is marketing, <laughs> but the book's really not about defining what marketing is. It's about it's about using your special senses to identify what really makes what is going to make people successful and how you can accelerate that success. Really. So, how is that not marketing? It is marketing. I know, but you never. We never talked about like what is marketing. I could actually say, well, "What is marketing? What's a market?" Well, What's that's a- not a bad no, question. That, 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 <laughs> no, it, it's an interesting question. It is an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, but I, there there is a kind of a commonly held definition, which I think is pointless, frankly, because most people hear the word marketing and it's a fuzzy, blurry word that doesn't have a concise meaning. And so, is advertising different than marketing, or are they the same? Well, yeah, well, true. The best, the best definition is perhaps advertising is moving people towards products and services. Marketing is moving products and services toward people. Yeah, and that's so cool. The marketing is whenever you take the perspective of the product or the service and you're moving it towards somebody, this can be like, you know, point of purchase displays. Yeah. And it can be. Um, you know, social media content, um, I mean, the how-to video on YouTube, you know, how to install this product you just bought. That would be considered, by some people's definition, marketing, where advertising is when you're buying media for the express purpose of telling people about a product or service. 
And so I don't use that definition, frankly, but that's the only one I've ever heard that differentiated marketing as a different word than advertising. Uh, back to the cheating thing that they brought up. Um, I do believe in cheating, but it's not a dishonorable form right. of cheating. I see another shock because, and then we got to bring it full circle again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So cheating, cheating, uh, by my definition, is when you choose not to obey the unwritten rule. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, you know, unwritten rules are for fools. And yeah. traditional wisdom is usually more tradition than wisdom. And so whenever people are just going following the traditional wisdom, I'm going, nope, that traditional wisdom is wrong. And I'm not going to do that. How am I going to cheat? I'm going to cheat by doing what actually works while all these knuckleheads keep obeying these unwritten rules called traditional wisdom that has never been true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, that stuff never did work. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've heard you talk about cheating for years and years and, you know, I, I make and making everybody's ads. Uh, I mean, I, I, I come into to contact with a lot of the different, uh, you know, partners, clients and your clients and stuff like that. And, and, but I, and I've been able to explain it a few times and it has been a little bit shocking because there is, there is a little bit of a mark on an advertising <laughs> professional or, or something like that as being someone who is a little, I mean, there's a, there can be a, a like this guy's a con man. And so when you say, Oh, well we yeah. cheat. When, when then you, they're like, you, <laughs> like, of course you cheat. You're an advertising guy. And it's like, no, no, no. But here's the way we do it. We find out what is really in the heart of the, you know, of the advertiser of the business owner. And we amplify that. And we, and we, we leverage their unused assets or unleveraged assets and tell their story. And that brings people to them and makes people feel good about them and make them want what they have when they need it, what they, the person sells. That's one aspect. There's a bunch of other aspects of cheating, but yeah. yeah, I'm I'm really proud. I'm really proud that he did that very well. I know, right? Dave, he's, it's like in 20 some years of, uh, I finally got it. (laughs) 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 That's right. Uh, That's good. Well, okay. So I want to go back to, unless uh, if you had, did you have something else to say on that, Roy? No, no, no. I'd wait to hear from Rashi. Oh, right. Rashi, are you still there with us? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here, man. Yeah. I'm just listening to you. I'm listening to you guys and stuff. I'm listening to what y'all are talking about. Well, well, All I, right. I, I want to go back to this uh, at the beginning of this, this whole idea, you know, say wiener dog marketing and, and the whole idea for the book was I'd heard Roy, I'd heard you tell the story about basically being able to uh, or, or how the, how the beautiful lions club wiener dog races became very popular and how three ideas were presented to you. And you picked the, you picked the, uh, the one that you thought uh, at the beginning was going to be big and you supported it, and it turned out you were right. It did turn out to be this big, huge thing, and that partnership between you and and the Butte Alliance Club and you promoting it and them them putting this on uh, turned into this big, huge thing that you know attracts thousands of people and hundreds of of wiener dogs. And I thought, you know, wouldn't that be interesting to find out, you know, what are the qualities that that you're looking for in order to spot. Uh, success before it happens. And I think I said that. So what I wanted to do is I want to ask you, Roy, I, I just thought about this. Uh, when when uh, you were first approached, do you remember how long it took for you to get over, ah, here's this person asking me for money and to go, oh, there's something here that is interesting that I want to get involved in? Like, what was it that took you, that, that grabbed your attention that said, oh, I want to actually get involved in mm-hmm. this? Because I don't, they, they didn't pitch okay, well- the first, the first thing you have to understand is that um, anything you've seen before, anything you've heard before, is predictable. Right. And when things become predictable, basically you've created a cliche. And a cliche is just never new, surprising, or different. Now, whenever they said, here's the three things we're going to have. We're going to have this precision drill team. And it's going to be precision lawn chair drill team. Right. And I instantly knew that wasn't going to work because there aren't enough people, if any, I'm not sure there's any people that are willing to create the choreography for a really clever precision lawn chair, um, synchronized drill team marching 
stink, right? right. You're going right. to march down the road. You're going to do all these precision things with your, with your chairs. I'm going, oh, it sounds clever, but there's nobody that's going to be willing to do that. This thing's not going to see the second year. Logistics. The first year, nobody's going to sign up. Yeah, it's just, it's just nobody's going to do that. And, you know, I think it would be amazing if people would actually do it, like synchronized swimming in the Olympics, right? Yeah. But they're not going to do that with lawn chairs, not anywhere. Yeah. Said, yeah, that's not going to work. Nobody's going to do that. And the other one was, uh, it was the riding lawnmower racing. Right. I'm going, eh, this is just variation. I mean, we've all seen stock car races and we've seen, you know, motocross races and we've seen every kind of races, every kind of crash that can happen in a race. And lawnmowers, it's like, okay, just again, nobody's going to take it seriously enough to put in the time, energy, or effort to make these things really fun. Yeah. And it's also going to be kind of dangerous. And so, yeah, that's not, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. Then they said wiener dog races. Now, if it was any other kind of dog, right. I would not have gotten involved. Right. Yeah. So why wiener dogs? Because they, by definition, are ridiculous. Yeah. They are ridiculous little dogs. And that's why we call them wiener dogs. They're way too long and they have way too short of legs. They're too short, too long, and their legs are too short. They're just disproportionate in every way. And with those tiny little, you know, just slightly elongated feet that they call legs on a wiener dog, I'm going, it's like caterpillar races. This is just <laughs> funny. Right. And I said, and everybody loves their wiener dog, and everybody thinks their dog's the best. I'm going, yeah, this is going to be huge. This is going to be huge whether I get involved or not. And I don't want to get involved with some loser thing. Right. And I said, so I'm going to do the wiener dog. And I said, well, somebody else already wants the wiener dog. And I said, great. I'm out. I'm sorry. I'm not going to support a loser thing. I'm just not going to do it. And they said, well, don't you care about supporting the community? <laughs> said, really? Not, not that much, actually. No, it's not really the reason I'm doing it. Right. I said, I want to be part of something that's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to work, and everybody's going to love it. Right. And you only have three things, and that's the only one that's ever going to work. And so, again, it's a simple process of deduction. The trap, Peter the trap that people fall into. They can imagine these amazing, amazing riding lawnmowers having these races, and it's like the Jetsons, you know? Sure. And I'm going, yep, that's not going to happen. And they can imagine this precision lawn chair drill team. They can imagine that the same way they imagine synchronized swimming in the Olympics, but I'm going, yeah, it's just not going to happen. What are the odds of that actually happening? And people don't love their lawnmowers, and people don't love their lawn chairs. Guess what people do love? Right. Their dog. They love their dog. You know. And so in Mark, go ahead. <clears throat> oh, I was going to say, I I didn't know this before, uh, before I did the interview with you and even with Diane, but I didn't realize that you had a wiener dog growing up. Isn't that, um, did you have a wiener dog well, growing my up? My sister did. Yeah, you, I, we had one. I was about five. Okay. And it was actually my sister's, my sister's dog. And it was a terrifying little wiener dog. Yeah, really? sometimes they are. <laughs> yeah, they have bad and attitudes, so, like like no, chihuahuas. I didn't, I didn't have I didn't have any fond relationship with a wiener dog. I had a beagle. Oh, uh, gotcha. Part beagle, part cocker spaniel, and part uh, wiener dog. So it was this beagle with these super short little legs, and her name was Pearl. But she was only maybe one third wiener dog or maybe half wiener dog. But she had the coloring the coloring of. Uh, a beagle and the long hair of a uh, cocker spaniel. Oh, so it was weird. Interesting. Yeah, long hair, oh, okay. wiener dog. We had our aunt and uncle had uh, like a bunch of wiener dogs that they all named Heidi. Yeah, that's true. That's right. We have this. <laughs> we have this picture of Dave and I as little tiny toddlers, in like both in brown suits, I, standing next to this little brown wiener dog named exactly Heidi. Exactly, just me. I just inherited that. Oh, is it just you? It's just me. Yeah, oh. in a brown suit. But yeah, I just inserted myself into the picture. I, and I think that Heidi was like Heidi number three for them too. It's really they just kept getting wiener dogs and oh, kept naming them they Heidi. Had a whole bunch of wiener dogs at the same time. Not at no. the same. No, no, no. one after another. Dogs, just one know? after another, sort of. Oh. Oh, sequential wiener dogs. Yeah. Rashid, Rashid, do you have any any relationship with anybody in your family to wiener dogs? <laughs> uh, we had we had a wiener dog when we was when we was younger. My grandmother had one. Really? Are you talking about the you talking about the long, long, long dogs that look yeah. like they they their legs are short to the ground? Yeah. Dash hounds. Yep. Yeah. 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 My grandmother had one when we was younger. Yeah. Right. What and, did you name it? Name, it was named Zach. 
Oh, Zach. A, oh, interesting. It's a right. people name. And, and, and yeah, that's what what did you did you like the wiener dog? What what were, what were your thoughts about this wiener I, dog? I, right? I, just love, I love dogs. Period. I love all type of dogs. So yeah, I love that dog. It, it, it actually died and stuff. No, you know what? It didn't die. This old mean next woman, this old woman next door named Miss Proctor, actually threw poison over and killed it. What the oh, heck? That's awful. <laughs> yeah. What the oh, heck? Man. That's terrible. A mean old woman like in our eighties. Two poison over there and killed it, and we found out that she did that. Holy cow! Yeah. Wow, it's terrible. Well, that's one way to stop a wiener dog, I guess. I mean, goodness, that's yeah, terrible. Well, that's awful. Well, okay. yeah, but you know, <laughs> she had to live with herself after that. Yeah, really. The, um, right, you're right. You so right. The thing that uh, the thing I think is at the center of this, Peter, is that. Whenever you're you're looking for the wiener dog, you're looking yeah. for the wiener dog idea, right? Right. What it comes down to is most advertisers feel like they need to educate the public. Right. If only the public understood all the things that I understand, then they would choose us because we are the right choice. Right. And so they, they set out to educate the public and get the public to care about what they care about. Right. And I said, that's always a bad idea. Bad idea. Always a bad idea. Yeah, doesn't work. What you have to do is you have to find out what the public already cares about. What yeah. do they already care about? Yeah. And then do something that focuses on that. Be for what they already care about. Be That's for right. that. And yeah. if people love their dogs, and plenty of people have wiener dogs, and even people that have wiener dogs think it would be fun to have a wiener dog race. Right, right. And they think, I think we have a shot, you know, at winning the wiener dog race. Right. And, they, and so, yeah. the, you know, and so I'm going, of course that's going to work. People people are going to want to see it because it's fun, and people are going to want to do it and bring your dog. And then I said, of course, this is this has all the markings of success. And Peter, Dave, and Rashi, I'm telling you, it's always that easy. You just right. have to think about it for a minute and say, what is it that people – are all ready, they're just primed to jump in the middle of this. Of yeah. course they're going to do this. It's just too much fun, and it's not a real hard thing to do, like right. precision lawn chair drill team. Right. And, um, you know, the, yeah. uh, the riding lawnmower races were just fundamentally, you know, been there, done that. Right. You know, this is like, it, it's right. not it was going to be incredibly hard. It was just just not that special. The other ideas are hilarious in your mind. The concepts of them are pretty funny, but you can see that they're not, I mean, the execution is going to suffer. But, so here, okay. and, uh, yeah? You made, a, you made a perfect point, and here's why. Those kinds of ideas always come up in brainstorming sessions. Mm, and right. what happens is when, you're, when people are brainstorming, they don't actually consider the execution and yeah. they don't actually consider is this piece something people are already interested in and so anytime you look at a long list of fundamentally bad ideas it was somebody having a brainstorming session and they all thought this was really clever because they were imagining imagining it being executed you know with precision and commitment and dedication and i'm going but are those things available are those things right. actually available from public yeah well, it's so like, go ahead, go ahead. Well, you're gonna say that but i'm gonna catch up well i, I was also gonna say that uh now we never really and as, as far as i can remember we never actually advertised the wiener dog races with videos of the wiener dog races they're fun to watch right they're fun to watch but we advertised them on radio and with posters Definitely. that over dramatized what, what was going to happen right. because we knew it because it was easy to do. It was easy to over dramatize what was going to happen and, and, and kind of create a, a, a mythical, you know, on top of the funny idea already. Right. But I don't think we actually showed videos of them running because, because no, we, it, never did. we, we made, it's more special than when people come and see it. It's just funny and it doesn't matter at, at, at that point. Almost. Right. I was going to try to make a, I was thinking also of us advertising uh, at jewelry and how jewelry is a visual thing that, you know, ooh, the cool piece of jewelry, the cool piece of jewelry, but that didn't work nearly as well 
as advertising what was going to happen when you gave, the reason people were giving jewelry, the reason people were doing this thing to make someone else feel good, you know, or to express their love and affection, appreciation for another person. That is a whole lot more uh, endemic to, to people than pieces of jewelry themselves. Well, I think, I mean, you know, the other thing that's happening is even in a piece of jewelry, how small is it? And so we're always imbuing right. this little piece, this yeah. little object with symbolic meaning that goes far beyond the actual object itself. And yeah, the same yeah. thing with wiener dogs. These are little small dogs that don't do feats of wonder. They do feats of ridiculousness. And, but we root for them because they, are, they, pers- they personify, they typify the underdog. And that connects in something... You know, literally something deep inside of underdog. us they really are literally the underdog right under everything and so when you're you know when you're talking about things uh you're making something into a hero that's not a hero you're making a piece of jewelry a significant a significant uh, thing that's a, an example of love and and commitment and relationship even though it's this tiny little hunk of metal uh then that's tapping into something that we naturally want to do anyway Right. And so that's that, you know, that's that's the what Roy's talking about cheating. Right. There. Right. Why? Right. He's he did tapping that. into yeah. what people want and he's he's giving it to them so that they're he grabs a hold of their imagination, gets their imagination involved. But then the execution of it is still hilarious and still, you know, wonderful to to put on uh, yeah. and watch these these wiener dogs or, or get this piece of jewelry, because when you first look at it, it does sparkle. Right. Yeah, and we did that for years and years and years with various different jewelers that were independent, like small independent jewelers and made them into huge, you know, businesses and and bedrocks of their community even uh, because they could... You, because we we myth we made big the actual presentation. I mean, the actual reason why people were getting it. We tapped into the people's hearts and they said, yes, that's what I want to do. Uh, instead of trying to show and beauty, you know, trying to show and the execution is easier that way too. You can just talk about it on the radio. You can get to a whole lot of more people instead of having to have the right lighting and the right picture and the right way that it's, you know, shown and stuff like that. We do that too, but that's ancillary. It's like, it's, it's, uh, it's reinforced by the story. You know, it reinforces the story. Yeah. Zig Ziglar was never an advertising guy. Um, he was a remarkable salesman, and I really liked Zig Ziglar. I always did. Yeah. Um, he was one of the very, very few motivational speakers I ever thought really had anything to say. And I remember him saying one time, how many tens of millions of quarter-inch drill bits that Black & Decker sold every year? And he says that nobody has ever, ever wanted a quarter-inch drill bit. They all want quarter-inch holes. Yeah, right. And he said... <laughs> The quarter inch hole is what they're after. Nobody wants jewelry. They want the reaction of someone they love. Yeah. And he said, nobody wants fertilizer. What they want is green grass yeah. and beautiful flowers. Right. And he said, so don't describe the fertilizer and, and talk about the fertilizer. It is the, the green grass and the beautiful flowers is what they actually want. So talk to them about what they actually want. Don't talk to them about the thing. You know, it's like, hey, you need a quarter inch hole. How are you going to make a quarter inch hole in this thing? It needs to be a perfectly round quarter inch hole so you can flip a bolt through it. Well, we have a solution for that at Black and Decker. It's called our quarter inch drill bit. That's right. And so, see, that's, that's a new, surprising, and different way to advertise a drill bit. It's like a wiener dog, isn't it? It's like yeah. wiener dog racing. Right. To say wiener dog racing, well, those are paired opposites. Dave, you're the one that taught me about paired opposites. When you have one thing and another thing that contradicts it, wiener dog contradicts racing, and racing contradicts wiener dog. And when you start talking about drill bit, by opening your story about talking about this need for a hole and why you need this hole and what you need to have a hole in and why the hole needs to be perfectly round because you need to put a bolt through it and you need to attach something on the other side. And how are we going to make that hole? Well, we have this thing called a drill bit. People are laughing because, oh, that's a really interesting ad. I'm going, strangely, you're just starting from the position of what matters most. Right. And then you move toward what what 
kind of contradicts that. It yeah. actually is a, a non sequitur. It's a it's a non it's an indirect it's an indirect partner of the first thing. And it's just weird. And so when you do that it always works. That's what I call cheating. Cheating, yeah. Yeah. So, That's one of the cheating uh, angles. So maybe let's let's start for the end of this book and think about what this book is going for, right? Is the whole idea of this book is how are you going to make your business grow? And we start with the end in mind of this book is, is nobody really wants to read a book about marketing. Right. What people want to <laughs> do is they want to read a book that lets them know how they can actually grow their business, how they can become more financially successful, how they can even have more satisfaction in some of the things that they're doing in life. Right. And so first of all, you know, what we've identified is you've got to find, you've got to be doing something or you've got to be involved in something that people already care about, that the world already cares about. You can't try to make the world care about something that they don't already care about. You have to pick something that the world already cares about. And then beyond that, you know, once you find that thing, the, the bigger, the even bigger determining factor than the idea is who is behind it. Right? Yeah. Right, right. Well, I, the people behind was, it. You know, I thought that was a pivotal point in the book, Roy, when uh, or in the interview that I was having with you when we were talking and I kept asking you about, okay, so tell me more about, you know, these ideas that will be successful and everything like that. And then there was this point where you said, you know, you and I have had different metaphors this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? I got a little, I got a little uh, nervous <clears throat> when I read that part. What, why'd, you, <laughs> why'd you get nervous when you read that it's part? It's like, what is going to happen next? <laughs> Like, oh, there's a conflict all of a sudden. <laughs> all right, there's so much going on with this episode. We can't finish it and fit it into this one episode. So we're going to complete it next week. Join us, Nevcast.